One of the great joys of pastoral ministry is to see parents of newborn children, especially young parents, return to the church when this happens after uh, an extended absence, perhaps due to college years or young adulthood. I mean, there's something about the birth of a baby, especially the birth of a first child, that causes many mothers and fathers to consider God again, to consider the church again. After all, the birth of a, of a new daughter or son usually brings with it this profound explosion of love. Where did that come from, <laughs> if not from God? Now, not all are called to parenthood, of course, but for those who are, for those who are, this is a common experience. At the same time, is there any reality that causes the heart to tremble as the birth of a son or a daughter? To wonder what our harsh world will throw at him or her? What will our baby grow up to see, to experience, and yes, to suffer? What I'm describing is also true of grandparents, y'all. Our uh, daughter, Eleanor, and son-in-law, John, just had their first child, our first grandchild, earlier this fall. And I went through a birth of a, of a new child three times earlier in adulthood. And yet I cannot believe how much unbounded love I have for this three-month-old baby named August. So the other night, in fact, the night they arrived, I sat in the den and I held August in my hands on my lap and I just looked into his face as I was aware that the TV was on and the news of the day was blaring into the room. Dear God, please protect this precious child who has come into a world like this one. Love and vulnerability. These are the two powerful realities that parents know, all parents know deep down. And I want to say that we must hold these two things together if we are truly to grasp Christmas, that which holds the very mystery of being for us, our God's demonstration of limitless love precisely in fragile vulnerability. Now, of course, the child whose birth we celebrate tonight is like no other. For those who truly believe that God sent Jesus into history as the Savior of the world, his birth changes everything. And so we hear the birth story again from the gospel according to Luke. As a storyteller, Luke is masterful. We may not even catch all of it in the English translations, and I think for my money, the King James Version captures this particular story in Luke the best. The angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So we hear again these beautiful, familiar verses in an atmosphere of liturgical beauty majesty, as well as warmth here, indeed festivity. But I don't think Luke would want us to allow this majestic prose with all of its sentimental force to obscure the main truth. The boy who is born grows into the man who suffers and is killed. And knowing the end of the story at the beginning lends the birth story particular poignancy. How could it be that God would come in this way, in a manger, and die in that other way, on the cross? Love and vulnerability together make the meaning of Christmas. So remember the birth story of Jesus in Bethlehem this was, this was only finally written down decades after Good Friday in Jerusalem. And Luke 
The author, Luke, is intentional crafting his gospel to show that we need to read the meaning of the crucifixion back into the birth story itself. That's the vantage point from which we are to hear again the birth story. And this is consistent with how the early Christians read this story and heard this story. In the early church, reflection on Christ's death led to reflection on his birth. There, there are many stories about the births of famous people in history, but there is none like this birth story because there is only one cross of Jesus. We're meant to get this even on Christmas Eve. So if you look at the account of, of, of Luke, if you, look, if you put the birth story of Jesus in Luke next to the, the death story, the crucifixion story in Luke, you begin to hear the rhetorical correspondence. You, you see the patterns. So there is the motif of a, of a journey. Joseph went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. And that's at the beginning. Much later, toward the end, they came to the place which is called Calvary. There is the body. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. And then toward the end, at the cross, a man named Joseph took the body down and wrapped him in linen and laid him in a sepulcher. There's the imagery of light and dark. There were shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And then at his death, there was darkness over all the earth, and the sun was darkened. And lastly, there are witnesses to this. The shepherds said to one another, let us go now even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass. And when it was all over, and all of his acquaintances and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off, beholding these things. So I wonder if we get it. After all of our years, after centuries of Christian devotion, how can we not again ask the question, why did God come like this if that was to be Jesus' destiny? What was God the Father willing to suffer by giving this kind of fallen world, his own baby, his own son. How might we imagine that? Such love, such vulnerable love. So again, I want to return to the analogy of, of parents and a young child. Years ago, when I was six years old, one day my father was out working in the yard um, and he was given charge of my younger brother, Bill, who was three. My mom went into town to run errands, and I went with her. Dad, again, was in the front lawn doing his errands. Bill was playing in the grass. After a while, my mother returned with me, got home, got out of the car, looked around, and asked my father, who had been quite busy, where's Bill? My father looked up, whipped around, alarmed. No Bill. A frantic search ensued. No bill. I grew up on the banks of a large river in eastern Virginia, so you can imagine the building panic. Finally, finally, Bill was discovered by someone about a quarter of a mile away, ambling down the side of US Highway 17 with cars blowing past him at about 60 miles an hour. A little child and dearly loved, wandering into a world with great danger. The vulnerability of having that child. Nothing reveals the intense love of a father quite like his desperate efforts to rescue his fragile child in a world where it is very easy to get lost and to get hurt. Except our Father in heaven his efforts are to rescue us through his fragile child who as an adult will not be rescued from a crucifixion coming down the highway of history. 
God comes to save the world, and God comes as a vulnerable baby. Why? Because before there can be a body on the cross, there must be a baby in the manger. Death only happens, death only happens to life. And no loving parent of a little child could ever wish that unless there was something even larger. No loving parent has ever been immune from feeling the vulnerability of that reality, nor has our God in heaven. So what breathtaking risk, infinite love and immeasurable vulnerability commingled in the birth of this holy child. This is the seed of the truth, of the meaning of the incarnation. And again, it changes everything. Unto us, a child is born. And the father watches as this newborn son is released into this kind of world, ambles into history, and will absorb its very worst. The father could chase after the son and and rescue him from all of that. But the good news is that this father is willing to lose him to the world of the lost. As much as the father loves the son, his love for the world, for you and for me, is too strong to stop what is set in motion. Again this very night, with this very birth. And so like new parents contemplating birth, this, this explosion of love into the world, I wonder what may be set in motion for you tonight as well. Amen.